Welcome to GoSimulation.com, the only place online where you can find comprehensive simulation training. My name is Nick Leister, and in this video we're going to create a nonlinear dynamic simulation in which we're going to simulate the effects of two components smashing into one another. Now in this case, what we're going to have are two components, the block on the left and the block on the right. We'll call the block on the left the stopper block and the block on the right the projectile block. Now the projectile block is going to be moving at 10 meters per second until it comes into contact with the contact block. And then once it comes into contact, there's going to be stress in between the two components. But for us, more importantly, what we want to calculate are the forces that are going to be exerted in between these two components. So that's what we're going to simulate in this video. I've done a few of these types of simulations in the past. And I know that before we actually get started, we're going to want to do a few things first. Now, what we're going to want to do is create a split line on this face because that split line is going to be the location where these two components are going to be coming into contact with one another. And the second thing that we're going to want to do is make sure that both of these two components are initially kissing. Now what I mean by that is that they're going to want to be in contact with one another at the initial point of contact. So the first thing that we're going to do is create the split line. Now in order to do this, I'm actually just going to hide this block. So I'll just select it from within the feature tree and then select hide. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this stopper in context to the assembly. So I'll just click on it once and then click edit part. Now I'm going to want to create a sketch. I'm going to do that on the front plane here. And I'm also going to get into a normal two position. I'll flip that around because I like to look at this face here. And now what I'm going to do is just create a circle where I believe there's going to be contact in between the two components. Now I don't exactly know how big the circle is going to be yet but what I'm going to do is just assign a dimension to this circle where I think there's going to be a contact and we'll just call it three inches for now. Even though it may be too small we'll just have to run one simulation and find out. Alright now I'll go ahead and exit out of the sketch and the next step is to project this sketch onto this face to break up the two faces here. So I'm going to come over to the features tab on the left here and then under curves I'm going to select split line and I'm going to project this sketch onto this face and then click OK. And now I have two split faces and that's going to make selecting this face for my contact a little bit easier. Now I'll just go ahead and exit out of the edit part and I'll go ahead and I'll show the projectile. The next thing that we're going to want to do is make sure that these two components are kissing. Now what I mean by that is that we're going to want to move these two components so that they're at the initial state of contact with one another. Now, before we actually make sure that that's the case, what I want to point out is that I've already made sure that this block right here can slide along the Z direction and that's its only movement. Now what we could do is we could figure out a clever way to mate these two components together. But what I'll show you is a bit of a trick that I like to use in situations like this. Now, in order to make sure that these two components are at the initial touching position, we can use this move component command up here. And then what we can do is make sure that under options we have collision detection selected. And then the next important step is just to make sure that we have this option selected as well, stop at collision. And the next step is really just to take this component and drag it until it bangs up against this component. And once we hear a sound, we'll know that these two components are touching. And then we can just click the OK button. 
The next thing that I'm going to do, just to ensure that the projectile doesn't move around while I'm creating the simulation, is just to fix the projectile in place. So in order to do that, we're just going to go ahead and right click and then select Fix. And now I can't move this component around and they're touching right at the initial point of contact. Now before we actually create the simulation, I just want to point out that a nonlinear dynamic simulation is generally a very complicated simulation to set up and to run. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over a few things that are absolutely critical to setting up an accurate nonlinear dynamic simulation. I'll try to point those values out as I go through the setup. But just keep that in mind, that this video is just to show you how to set up a simulation which is similar to this. Now, what we're going to do is create a simulation. And in order to do that, we're going to have to go up to the Simulation tab, click the drop down here, and then create a new study. And what we're going to do is call this Nonlinear Dynamic. And then what we're going to do is we're going to scroll down to the very bottom and then make sure that nonlinear is selected and then we have two options we have the static and then we have the dynamic we're going to need to use the dynamic option here and then we'll go ahead and click the OK button now before we actually go through the tree here like a normal simulation we have to note that a nonlinear dynamic simulation is very time dependent. And so what that means is that the simulation will run for a certain amount of time. And that simulation will also go through or jump through different time steps as it's creating the simulation. Now setting up those time steps to, be, to have an accurate simulation is very important. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plop in some time steps, but I want you to know that coming up with those time steps is absolutely critical to the accuracy of your simulation. So what I'm going to do in order to enter in my time steps is I'm just going to right click at the top here and then go to properties. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter in my time steps. So my start time is going to be 0 seconds and my end time is going to be point Whoops. We got to enter in 0 0.0001. That's going to be my end time. So we're not simulating a very long period of time because as these two components smash into one another, the amount of time that they're smashing into one another isn't very long to begin with. And the next step is we're just actually going to leave the automatic time steps down here as well. And now we're just going to click the OK button. Uh, before we do that, actually, we're going to want to make sure to change the solver to use this large problem direct sparse solver. This solver is new to SolidWorks 2014, and I think that this solver goes faster than these two for this simulation. So we're just going to um, select this option here and then click OK. Now we're going to apply material to both of these bodies. Now just for the sake of time and for the sake of simplicity, what we're going to do is just use the default alloy steel that comes with SolidWorks. So in order to apply this material, we're just going to go ahead and right click at the top here and then apply material to all. This will apply material to both of the bodies and then we can just select alloy steel and then select apply and then close. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set up contact in between the two components. Now I've created this split line here to make the contact a little bit easier for the software. Now in order to apply this contact, what we're going to want to do is right click on connections and then apply contact sets. And this is going to be a no penetration contact between this component and if I can zoom in here, this component. So both of these two components are going to be in contact with one another. And now what we're going to do is click the OK button. Now what we're going to do is apply fixtures. 
Now a fixture is just meant to hold components in place and prevent them from moving around. And in this case, what we're going to do is apply the fixture to this stopper part right here. So I'm going to apply a fixture to prevent this face from moving as this component smashes into this body. So with this face selected, I'm just going to right click on fixtures and then select fixed geometry. And scroll down, make sure that the face is selected in here, and then click the OK button. The next thing that we're going to do is apply an external load. Now, because this is a nonlinear dynamic simulation, we actually have the option to apply the load as an initial condition. Now, what an initial condition is, is it is an initial state of the simulation as it starts out. And in this case, what we're going to do is tell the software that initially, this block right here is going to be traveling at 10 meters per second in the Z direction. So let's go ahead and create that external load. In order to do that, what we're going to do is right click on external loads, and then we're going to select initial conditions. And what we're going to do is apply an initial condition as a velocity in which this entire body is going to be traveling in the Z direction. Now, this tells us that we can only select faces, edges, or vertices. But that's not the case in this particular simulation. It's not just a face, an edge, or a vertice that's traveling at 10 meters per second. It's the entire body. So what we're going to do is we're going to expand out the tree right here, and then we're going to select the projectile from the tree, and that will put the entire projectile in this section right here. And then the next step is to apply the direction. Now we know that the direction is going to be along this edge right here, and so we'll just leave it at that. Now it's a little bit hard to see which way it's going to go. Is it going to go left or is it going to go right? We, we actually can't really see that because there are no arrows on the, on the screen telling us which way it's going to go. And so the, the easy way to tell which way the velocity is going to go, left or right, is just to hover over a face edge or vertice, and that will produce arrows indicating the direction that the velocity is going to be traveling in. So it's showing that the velocity is going to be in the negative z direction, and we actually want it to go in the opposite direction. And so this is very important. This tells us that we need to enter in negative 10 meters per second. And that way, these arrows, uh, which are telling the software if anything's positive, it's going to be going to the right. What that's essentially telling the software is, is that the block will be traveling to the left. OK. So now that we have our initial condition in, we can just click the OK button. The next thing that we're going to do is apply damping. Now, we actually don't need to have damping. It's probably not going to matter too much for us because we're only concerned with that initial force of the two components hitting one another. But I just want to show you where it's entered and how it's entered in. Damping is entered in here. And the way to enter it in is you just right click and then select Edit Definition. And the, the way that nonlinear dynamic simulations work is it uses something called Rayleigh damping. Now Rayleigh damping um, assumes that there's going to be a different amount of damping depending on the natural frequency or the natural vibration of the structure. And so by playing with this alpha coefficient and this beta coefficient, you can essentially change the amount of damping uh, at different frequencies. Now with this said, I'm just going to enter in some, some fake values. These are not real values, and they're not necessarily accurate for the sort of simulation that we're going to run. But I'm just going to show you how to enter them in. So we're just going to put 0 0.02 for the alpha and 0 0.04 for the beta. And then we're just going to go ahead and click the OK button. Now before we mesh and then run the simulation, I want to do one thing real quick. And that is that as this, these two components bump on into one another, what you'll notice is that this component is completely unrestrained. And that's to say that this component only has an initial condition saying that it's initially traveling in the z direction at 10 meters per second. 
Now, once it bounces off of this component right here, the way that it bounces away uh, will sort of dictate how easily the simulation will be able to run properly. And so if this tilts, it may tilt one way, is what I'm saying, as it bounces up against this component right here. And that tilting, or how it's going to tilt, depending on the mesh and other things, that tilting is going to make the, the simulation more unstable than it needs to be. And so what we're going to do in order to fix that instability is a little bit of a trick. And that is, I'm actually going to prevent just a vertex right here from moving in the X or Y directions. If this vertex will be able to move in the Z direction, it just won't be able to move up or down or left or right like that. So in order to apply that fixture, I'm just going to go ahead and right click on fixtures and then select advanced fixtures. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to unselect this guy right here. And I'm just going to go ahead and select this vertex. And then I'm also going to just select this face. I'm going to scroll down. I want to prevent this vertex from moving not that direction. I actually want to keep it, if you can see the arrow right here, what this is essentially doing is locking it from moving in or out. That's not what I want to do, so I'll just go ahead and restrain it in these directions. And then I'll go ahead and click the OK button. The last thing that we're going to do is just click the Run button. Now, what we should probably do is apply mesh controls and stuff like this, but that would normally come later on down the track. We're just going to go ahead and click the Run button and have it mesh with whatever default mesh it's going to use, and then we're going to go through the simulation. Now that the simulation has finished running, what we could do is we could take a look at the stress or displacement at any given time step. And to do that, the way that you can look at any time step is you can right click and then select Edit Definition. And once you select Edit Definition, then you can take a look at any given time step by going through these time steps right here and then click OK. Now what we're interested in is the contact force between the two components. And so that's the time history force in between these two components as they're bumping up against one another. Now the way that we can get that is by right-clicking on results and then selecting list result force. And then we can select contact friction force and then we can select one of the two faces. I'm just going to go ahead, zoom in, and then select this guy right here. And now what we can do is click this update button and once we click the update button, then we can click the response graph. Now this will give us a response graph with time for the amount of force in between the two components. And from this graph, we can actually see at its peak what the maximum amount of force is. It looks like it's about 1.1 about, uh, or 1.2 times 10 to the 8th newtons in between these two components. So I hope you learned something from this video. Um, if you did, please follow me on Go Simulation. You can sign up to the newsletter or you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you and welcome to Go Simulation.